Okay, Jazz, see you. Alright, alright. Keep it rolling. Welcome to the Manual Breathing Podcast. My name's Kagan. I have Caleb and Jay here, and we're going to talk about pretty much anything and everything in hopes that you find some of it interesting. And uh, I think I'm ready to start. (laughs) (laughs) How you guys doing? I'm doing great. I'm sure you guys. <laughs> Not an answer. Uh, you guys are all wearing hats. I wasn't notified. Yeah. Uh, so about you being on this podcast any day after today. Oh. Uh, <laughs> you know what? Never mind. We'll just wait till the yeah, end. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You guys are hear this. So uh, you know. Wait, hold on. You, that reminds me. You know those jobs? Like, have, I don't know if it's ever happened to you guys. Steve. Uh, yeah, jobs well, of the Steve variety, where. Or at least this has happened to, to a couple of my coworkers where they've been let go, but they've been given the option to finish their shift. And I've even had a coworker who has said, "You're going to be let go, but you can finish the rest of your scheduled your next scheduled two weeks of shifts." What? <laughs> and uh, the guy did most of them, and then he was like, "Wait a second, <laughs> what am I trying here for?" No, I legitimately, there's this guy I used to work in a restaurant. And there was this busser who got fired during his shift. And this man was about to go into the military. Like, he was leaving anyway, and they knew it. And the only reason they fired him, like, I know this in my heart, is because they were trying to make him an example. Yeah, they were trying to make an example out of him for all the other employees, like the teenagers that were working there that were just on their phones. So they literally said, you're fired because you're on your phone too much. And he was like, I've been working all night. What are you talking about? <laughs> oh, and that's so, so scummy. Yeah, and so they fired him and were like, and here's your closing tasks for the rest of the shift. And he, so he went out, and I was just sitting in the break room, and I was like very new and didn't know anybody. Yeah. And there was this dude that was like, you got fired? Are you serious? Like him and his friend were out there just like talking, and like his friend was about to quit too just out of like solidarity. And then the dude was like, I don't know, like I, I got to go and do the rest of this. And he was like, what are you talking about? And he was like, well, they fired me, and then they gave me, like, the rest of my work. <laughs> and he was like, don't do, do it. Leave. <laughs> like, go. They didn't want you here, dude. Like, don't, like, don't do the work that they asked you to do. That's their fault. Like, I need that extra so, $20, uh, though. So what does this have to do with hats? Um, I'm glad you brought that up. Oh. Oh. Where's because, this going? Uh, my topic... Is things that should be free, but aren't. Ah, oh, like hats. Uh, of course, Just why like, Why not? Hats are actually the only thing I think that should cost uh, Jay, off. does this have anything to do with what we talked about, like, the other day at work? Okay, so I may... <laughs> Kagan and I may or may not be working in retail, and that same retail place Caleb also used to work in. Um, and I was there, and I was doing a different task than I am normally assigned to. I normally have my routine. I go in and I do this very specific thing, and uh, that's my shift every day. And then you were like, "We deserve free health care." Exactly. It, it, right? it basically. He's basically. Oh. What happened was I got put Bernie into. Bernie Sanders uh, on the podcast with us right now. I wanted to actually preface this and say like I don't want to get very political, or these are just know, thoughts you have. These are just thoughts. I mean, I'm not trying to like tell you to vote. For anyone, can what I tell I, them who to vote for so I can lose half our audience? What I am, what I am saying is that you should vote this coming November. Just in general. Just in general, you should definitely, definitely vote. Uh, but so I had this thought because I was actually working. I already said retail. I was working in the uh, feminine hygiene area, uh-huh. and I thought to myself, a lot of these. Uh, women's products are are selling a lot yeah it's almost as if half the entire population <laughs> needs needs, needs to uh, continue these feminine hygiene one. products and when he yeah, says he was wondering, wondering. Mm. well I mean, okay so basically so what kind of stuff we're, yeah we're talking about, okay there's there's plenty of things on this list um but i guess i'll start with that i, I do believe that you know pads and tampons for women women use them at all like all the time yeah they're buying them all the time those i think should be free i mean th- that's something that's in their biology like that's something that they literally need unless society wants to just to accept that women are gonna I be i want you to know you just lost like 
all yeah. of the like weak men in our audience. Yeah, we don't who, have uh, to talk about this. They, they can't yeah. say the words tampon and pad. The weirdest it's... half whisper, half yell I've yeah. ever heard. <laughs> like, that made that ringing. You know when you get like a ringing thing in your ear? Like yeah. just out of random, just whenever and, Caleb and it goes speaks, away. yeah, just like, <laughs> oh, every single time. Um, and while we're on the subject, you know, I don't want to get, I don't want to get uncomfortable for anyone, you know, but I just think that some of these things are a natural part of life. Um, some of them might be, yeah. And so I and and so without getting to a uh, PG thirteen, I do think uh, maybe some things, and I want you guys' opinions. Do you think, like, uh, birth control, like condoms? should be free is that something that is up to us or up to the men or just people in general to decide that to be responsible and they should go out and buy them if they're going to plan on doing these sorts of activities i've never had you ask us a question that i can already tell me and kagan are going to be on complete opposite <laughs> sides of the fence on I'm your move kagan whoa, whoa, whoa i mean what are you talking about i think <laughs> I think that, yeah, practice safe sex in oh. whatever way you can. I, you know. Well, I'm anti safe sex. It's the opposite <laughs> of what you said. Uh, have the most dangerous. <laughs> I'm glad you let me go first so you can just say the right thing and then everyone just assumes that I'm about to like, go in. But, um, <laughs> like, I think that, um, I mean, it is free if you go to like certain places, right? Like, if you go to like a. Yeah. Uh, what's it called? Yeah, if you go to like the semantics uh, of all these things, I'm sure that like in a lot of women's restrooms they have the vending. Planned Parenthood yeah. gives out a lot yeah, of free birth control to of. women, and then a lot of uh, condoms. Like, oh, there's even uh, condom uh, free program on campus here. So there's plenty of places that's here, there, and it's even yeah. advertised on some posters around campus because they really just want students to practice safe sex, so yeah. they don't endanger their college career. So that's, yeah, absolutely, that's that's, that's amazing. You said that we were going to be opposite on this. What, what do you What do you think? Uh, more babies, <laughs> more babies now, please. More babies, uh, more babies now. Got yeah. it. Uh, <laughs> I take, believe the one child in policy <laughs> of China and just reverse it. Yeah, I I did the Uno reverse card when I saw that with China. Mm. Um, so yes, uh, well, those are things that, that are good talking points. I mean, they are some they are free in some places, like you had mentioned. Yeah. Um, another thing I think that should be free is internet. Internet? I mean, it is I, a big part of people's lives now, I guess. I agree, and more people... If people are starting to recognize it in debate that it is a utility that is necessary to live a common life. And if you want to move up, like, in economic classes, it's very hard to do so if you're in a lower-income class if you don't have access to Internet. Well, because it's job just... applications, half the ones that I went to uh, this week at the career fair, you know, there is free Internet on campus, but... If you have to drive home every day, you know, getting work done from home is very tough. And all those applications, every uh, booth that I went to at this career fair was telling me, go online and apply. We get it. You're wicked smart. You went to career wicked fair. Wicked smart. But what, smart, wicked smart. smart. But what I'm saying is, is like, like, water and electricity is the same. Like, we have to pay yeah. for that. Why, do we, why would we get internet for free? If that's the standard, like, you need it to live life comfortably. How about all of them? Uh, everything for free. Just Let's the go. Girl. Well, like, I think it should be held to the same standard as, like, not having water and electricity. Maybe not water because water is vital to human life. Mm-hmm. Clean but water. I think electricity and internet should be held about on the same level because internet is so essential well, to moving up anywhere nowadays. But people aren't getting electricity for free is what I'm saying. So why would yeah. internet for free? The companies are getting with it though. Uh, I was at Disneyland uh, earlier this year and they said they're trying to go pap- entirely paperless. No more fast passes, no more tickets, paper tickets uh, by this summer. Do you Jay, know what the heck does this have to do with internet? No. Like, well, how are you going to download your straws to drink Starbucks? Oh. Without internet. <laughs> what? <laughs> but how... Why are we going to stroke? Thank you, I'll be here all week. In Disneyland? <laughs> <laughs> in Disneyland, you... I don't want my ticket dying in the middle of the no. day. <laughs> and then I can't do, go in and out of the Hey, we need you to anymore. prove uh, you're still allowed to be here. <laughs> <laughs> but, like, no. Like, if you're going to California Adventure and, like, you leave and come back to Disneyland, like, what? you? That's true. You just, like... It's called a well. stamp. They can still do... Fool. St- a stamp? You yeah, you come in there one. with a charge phone, you get a stamp, and then you can walk back in. I've s- oh, well, I guess they could just look up your information. Or they could just save your face to some yeah. data bank, and then, well, I did put some bullet points for... He put some bullet points, I did put some... 
bullet points for the internet thing. It did, <laughs> it did kind of uh, uh, go along the lines of what you were saying, you know, uh, economic growth, um, people being on the same uh, playing field. There should be internet. It can save lives. I mean, you have access to instructions. What if someone gets bit by a snake? Do you pee on it or do you suck it out? <laughs> uh, okay, I want to be clear that you don't do any of those. Yeah. <laughs> the answer is neither, but you would only know that from looking on the internet. Jay from um, Boy Scouts, bro. And lastly, and equally important about you know, having internet is that um, memes make people happier. Mm-hmm. I mean, He's got on. you there. The uh, pursuit of happiness, you have the right to it. <laughs> By the way, I'm not against this. <laughs> Kagan so hates many, poor people. There's so many basic part five. Person. Every I'm podcast that comes up that you hate person. poor people. Um, okay, so next on the list of things I think should be free is can I complain about something real quick? Oh yeah, yeah. You put ice in my drink, me. and now every time I lift it up, I have to be like particularly careful. It's not hitting the sides. Yeah, you're a piece of trash, Jay. Yeah, I can't believe you put you ice in me a drink. cold beverage. In How the, dare you? In the I, town we live in, of all places. Right? Oh, <laughs> this monster. Remove that from the podcast, because now everybody's going to be like, this guy's a jerk. <laughs> he just <laughs> roasted some guy for putting Don't ice in his drink. <laughs> um, I think sunblock should be free. Oh. That's a, that's one I would never think of. So I went to a base, I went to a spring training game down in the valley. Whatever valley you think. Um, and, well, during, in, in there, sorry, we just had a power outage. That was a big <laughs> Everything, so Everything around us just shut <laughs> off and we were just trying to keep it natural. That's why we work off laptops. Exactly. <laughs> and honestly, electricity should be free. Uh, yeah. yeah. And like, electricity <laughs> should be free. Free boy electricity. And plentiful. Yeah. <laughs> what, would this happen a lot more if electricity was free, do you think? Ooh, like possibly. if they didn't have the money going straight to them and they had to wait for like government stuff like the government would be like so slow to like okay so this is the thing like every time like anybody talks about universalizing something so it's free under the government they always say like oh I think that service itself is gonna get worse okay it feels like you're about to say something that is against what I just said or like you're making like fun of me and I don't think okay. I like it a little bit of both let's just uh, uh, <laughs> move on <laughs> no, I ahead. think my echo dot is about to say something as soon as it finishes booting um, um, unfortunate, but that's right. okay. That's not copyright, right? Yeah, no, oh, I mean, oh no, sunblock is important. Um, yes. I went yeah. to I went to a baseball game, and in the the bathrooms they had sunblock dispensers, and I thought that's that was incredible. amazing. It doesn't have to be the highest quality sunblock, but you know, if we're trying to progress as a human race and and prevent like things such as skin cancer, yeah, I mean, SPF know. thirty at least. I don't know when it became a thing to just be like so selfish and against like giving anything free like everybody has like this not everybody such an exaggeration just kidding uh, but just me uh so many people have like that mentality of like you gotta pull yourself up by your bootstraps if you want to live like a good life and it's just like simple things like giving people sunblock so like you know if the homeless have to be outside in the sun all day and struggle to find shaded areas Sunblock would be really useful for I them, mean, I'm there, sure. There are so many jobs that take place outside construction, yeah. in the mailman. And you prevent stuff like skin cancer with Absolutely. that. So, would there be like a I ideally like a place where you could go and get your free sunblock I mean, and condoms probably, and birth control and public bathrooms? Probably I think so. Public bathrooms. I mean, for the sunblock, be, I can see. There could be just dispensers. Like it would sorry. have to be like a like a store because like you go to a public bathroom, people suck. Like they're just gonna take all of it yeah you know yeah. some block somebody's just gonna squeeze it all in their hands and put it in their pockets first and walk thought, away what an awful mental image first thing I thought of you should bring your own container who just well I'm just saying I've never se- all I'm saying is I've never seen someone go into a public bathroom and just drain the soap machines dry well yeah but like you got where are you gonna put that you know like you need the running water too sunscreen that's all you need Boom! Mm. Take it all. Use it later. Especially a homeless dude who's like, I don't want to come back here. I'm walking. You could, if you you could take like a I'm bucket walking. or a water bottle, you could fill it up with some soap, and then you could just get some water later and get some of your soap I bucket. And definitely, just... you're focusing on the wrong thing here. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we, we already we already deal with this problem with like soap in a in a public uh, restroom that runs out, or maybe how often public trash cans need to be uh, bagged and uh, replaced. Yeah. Obviously, everyone's going to run into some problems. There's going to be some empty sunblock dispensers, but yeah. I think if that is a new job that he's created to, 
uh, just refill those. I think, I think. Imagine stocking a whole store, or like at least a little, like kind of like a corner store, like gas station type deal. Yeah. It doesn't need to be huge, but like, no, nothing needs to be like Walmart or anything like that. Yeah. Just if okay, there's but a condoms select, is like the weird one to me. For like, because that would that one it seems like it would have to be like destigmatized before you could have them openly kind of on the street in vending machines or in like that's why I'm like whenever I feel like you see them in a bathroom. It's, like, in some weird, shady gas station on Route 66, and, like... Where you get your It's tips. got, like, a bunch of different flavors <laughs> of it, and it's all weird and creepy flavors. looking. Flavors. Yeah. Why, why am I joking? But, like, That's public <laughs> public condoms should be available, like, easier than going to, like, your local pharmacy, I'd say. I and just... other forms of birth control. Well, because, like, if you're getting it for free-ish, or yeah. for free, like... I just, I think that it should be an, an enclosed space where you, you can't yeah. just get robbed, you know, like, we're not robbed, but like, if there's somebody a condom dispenser, somebody could just sit there for 10 minutes and be like, I don't, won't have to come here for another however long, and I don't know if that's how it should be. I've always thought Kagan saw the best in people, but here he is seeing the worst, but you know, just people, somebody the filling their is, pockets with condoms. The issue is, well, you guys are making great points, but there are examples of these things, like, you know, people can keep taking napkins at a, a restaurant, or something like that. Yeah. And they will run out. But there's got to be a point of uh, over-satiation where people are like, please, it's enough napkins. <laughs> you know, and the same has got to be said maybe about uh, birth control. Like, you, uh, see, <laughs> you see, like, toilet paper in public bathrooms. That's locked up. Because it makes sense that certain people would want to take that with them. You know, wait, wait, but I can't see... Are condoms somebody running off with 50 condoms in their hey backpack. it's the 21st century you know we have technology you know you type in your passcode wrong into your phone too many times yeah. box you out for five minutes why don't you do the same for condoms you can take take 10 condoms if you really think you're gonna have a good night <laughs> <laughs> i'm about to revolutionize the condom business with after my that, engineering degree after that though um yeah it's it's not gonna dispense for another 10 minutes. I guess if you really want to play the system, yeah, you'll wait 10 minutes and do it again. <laughs> the but, idea, like the mental image of a man stay, taking 10 condoms, waiting outside a public bathroom for 10 minutes and then walking back in on repeat, just <laughs> filling his bag up over the course of like two hours. <laughs> okay. It's so funny that I want it to exist. I just, I just thought of something. Okay, so I do believe in people being ultimately good and all that kind of yeah. stuff. There are a few bad eggs. Ever since you said that, I'm like, oh, come on, man. Like, <laughs> <laughs> but, okay, perfect example. Candy on Halloween. You leave a bowl out and say take one. Yeah. There's just going to be somebody who takes 30, you know? Like, that's just how it works. So I'm not accounting. I, most people, they take the one. But there's one dude. And we can work with that. You know, I'm more of an in-between person when it comes to that. Uh, uh, I, I'll, I'll take a handful. But I won't take it all. Oh, yeah. you mean in-between, like, someone who's not, like, a thief. Someone I mean, a thief. You know? Like that? He's a half thief. There's a, there's a, gray, there's a, there's a gray area there. Officer, no, no, no. You don't understand. I could have taken $3 million, but I only took 500000 I so just I'm want you to know, if you arrest me, you're arresting... Half of a good man. <laughs> Half of an innocent man. Um, okay, so... And again, this this might start getting... I don't want it to get political. Like, I'm not trying to make a statement here. This is just a general thing that came up. And I feel like... Oh, I'll make when, a statement. When people are complaining about their medical bills, the one of the main ones they complain about is the ambulance ride. A hundred percent. Oh, like, my gosh. Man, like, the literal amb ambulance ride costs, like, a thousand dollars for that ride, you know? But I feel like that ambulance ride is so important. Well, Jay, you're saying it's important, like, then it should cost a lot of money. But what I mean is, like, you should have the right to have that chance to live with that, with that, that ambulance supplies. That ambulance supplies uh, or gives the EMTs the ability to do as much as they can do. To keep you alive mm. until you get to the hospital. And I feel like that should kind of be free. Whether or not you get to the hospital and they say, all right, you're going to need a new heart and it's going to be $100,000. Um, <laughs> that like, that is, that's another comment. <laughs> I don't need one of those anyways. <laughs> you, pull, you pull the plug yourself. Be like, this one is broken, so yeah, I might need another one. <laughs> but you I, know how many edgy Facebook posts I've made about not having a heart? <laughs> It'll be perfect now. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, so... That can be a discussion for another time as far as how much things should cost for procedures and things like that. But yeah, absolutely. every person should have that right 
to to try to live until you get to the hospital and they try to do some crazy yeah. stuff. Yeah, I'm gonna be real. John Oliver made a video today about free healthcare, so it's definitely got me in a mood. Topical. So I'm not gonna speak at all during this section. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, um, the I think that the ambulance thing. I think that's really true. Especially like I've thought about this a few times. What if someone is unconscious? Like if. Someone said, I'll call an ambulance for you, don't worry about it, as I was sitting there with a broken arm and a broken leg and a half-broken jaw. I would literally move my jaw to say, no, I'm good. Like, use my one good hand to text my friend. Like, I would never say yes to an ambulance ride. But if I'm unconscious and someone makes that call, like, why do I have to pay? Like, yeah. I'd have rather you guys not. ever been in that situation, like, personally? Yeah. Like I've been, I've been in it. Jay, have oh, you yeah, been in no, it? I haven't. Oh, I was, gonna, <laughs> <laughs> I was really terrible. excited. I was really gonna say, so representative of America. If you like, all of us just went, yeah, yeah. I've been there with like telling because I um one time my friend she got her hand ran over while ice skating Gross. and had like Ooh. to get like thirteen stitches. And I don't know if you know where the ice rink is in town, but it's right down the street from the hospital. And they were just like, oh, we'll call her an ambulance and like. My friend was just like, no, you won't. Uh, she's getting in the back of my truck, and we're driving her there. Dude, you know she what's had a... just blood gushing out of her hand yeah, while we said like, this. I, d- I wouldn't want to put, put, put a rag on it. Just clot it up. Yeah. Well, you would want an ambulance. You don't want the fees that come with the ambulance. Oh, yeah, no, I guess that makes sense. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so this might be like uh, a mistake uh, on the part of our educational system, or maybe I'm just stupid. But well, I, used I, have this, uh, I used to have this, bl- this thing where it's like, I don't want to call an ambulance for someone because I think I'm going to be charged for it. Like, I, I used to think, like, <laughs> I would get charged for the 911 call. Um, and, and I'm a 22-year-old man, and I'm still afraid to just call the police because I'm like, am I going to get charged for something because of this? Yeah. You'll call, like, the no-rush police line? There was a shooting <laughs> oh, outside yeah. of... There was a shooting outside of my house the other night, <laughs> no. and that thought literally came to my mind. I was like, dude, I got to call the police. And then I also went, oh, that's, that might be some money, though. <laughs> <laughs> you know, part of you was like, I need to call the police, but the other half of you was like, you know, maybe they did the thing. Maybe, maybe they did the thing. Maybe mission accomplished. They're done. <laughs> maybe they got the guy. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that's the half innocent and half guilty part of you. <laughs> it's so perfectly represented. So I have just a few more, and these okay. are very wildly in importance. Like, these, these like... Don't matter. You couldn't even <laughs> rank it. You couldn't rank it in order of importance. Yeah, it's just gonna be like cookies, pretty good, should be free. Uh, <laughs> the right to humanity. Workers should have the right to freedom. Pretty much same level. Um, deodorant. I wish. Trust me, dude. Engineering department, people, pretty smelly. People stink. People, people do stink, but, but stinky people would be very what nice. Do you, where do you stop though? Uh, free cologne, free toothbrushes. No, I don't want. Free... I don't want on the positive end of the stinky. Cologne spectrum. is indulging. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Then, uh, like toothpaste and toothbrushes. Those should be. Free. Yeah. See, no. No. Those. So I could. That is an interesting point. Um, Toilet paper. Okay. Well, again, you can go to a public restroom and just. You could, but didn't we just that. say that that was an issue? <laughs> yeah, <that's true. laughs> okay. So deodorant may be off the table. No, dude. I'm uh, still no. I I still want to debate this because. I'm no, wait, okay. I, can't, I can't imagine living like, 500 years ago. Oh my god. I'm sure we'd be used to it. Like, you know, you grow up in that age. Yeah. Probably like 500 years from now. It's like, how do they not have like lasers to zap away their BO? I don't know, because like some people in the world still don't wear deodorant. Yeah. Like that's not, like, Sorry. not everywhere wears deodorant. Do you know, do you want to know a weird fact about me? What's up? I cannot watch movies set in a time period I know this before yeah, the Game of Thrones <laughs> like Game of Thrones I never watched an episode and the reason is because anything said in that time period like some education here deodorant wasn't invented until 1890 and was not popularized until the 1900s with women first then men don't nice. want to go anywhere like if anyone ever brings up time travel for one eh, I'm black so probably not very far <laughs> back anyway but if I were white, then not still not very far back because I don't want to smell all these gross, gross people. I'm so mad, but I'm gonna bring it up. In Korea, they don't wear deodorant. Oh, interesting. How do you know about I that? I swear to God. How do you know about uh, what they do in Korea? So you can watch like historic and historic and 
uh, historical Asian like movies or anything like that and realize they're not sweaty boys. They don't have to wear deodorant. They probably smell fine. You saying I could watch a movie and realize that Asian people don't sweat? Yeah. Really? Well, I'm saying you know it now so you can watch it comfortably, not like Game of Thrones. Oh, stinky, I was like, people. I thought you were like, Kagan, Asian people don't yeah, they turn watch to, this movie. Yeah, they <laughs> turn to the screen in the movie and they go like, we uh, don't wear deodorant, in fact. Uh, <laughs> sponsored by Baby Powder. <laughs> what you got next, Jay? Um, I would say basic nutrition, Me- like meal packets. So like food. So again, again, this is another kind of one of those like, oh, it's no, we're just this is like super. Let's just take everyone's money and give it to everyone else. But I mean, like, they have we have soup kitchens. Yeah, we. I was like, I was like about to say we have that. food stamps. Food stamps. Yeah. But what if we just had like very basic, um, maybe in addition to those, very basic like you can come here to this information center or whatever and just grab like a meal packet and that's worth like it's like a carnation instant breakfast almost it's like it has the you know, bare minimum of what you guys have carnation I think you're just breakfast. describing like food stamps but simpler <laughs> yeah I think that this <laughs> is going to have to work for on today's bit, episode but... of Jay Learns Things actually exists <laughs> <laughs> okay I only got like two Jay do you, we just solve all your problems you have with humanity Jay's like oh I guess the world is pretty cool <laughs> I think we should have Roads to get us over passages of water. Jay, have you heard of bridges? <laughs> um, gym memberships. Nah, that's excess. Everyone that's has excess. the that's right excess. to be fit. <laughs> huge, bro. I'm Do not, some push-ups, you. I'm not bum. saying you gotta be fit. You know, I love. You know, you, we gotta love everyone of different shapes and sizes. But more for health reasons. If you want to go running, or if you want to, I guess you could just run outside. <laughs> A lot of countries. And some cities in America have just workout stations kind of spread out around the place. Oh, yeah, like, like parks in parks. Stuff. Yeah, exactly. And I feel like that should just become something that's, like, part of parks. Like, you should just have a workout area. So. I mean, frankly, we don't, like, I think we can, me and Kagan at least agreed, working out, like, gym memberships, very much excess, not yeah. a necessity for every person. But it would be good for a society if people had more access to easily work out. So, like, I'd say that's a good solution. To Honestly, um, if there's any entrepreneurs out there, uh, do some sort of work with the government and get paid for that and then get a bunch of taxes off or something like that. Um, yeah, go do that. Yeah, go do that. It sounds easy. I just said it and thought of it. So Yeah, and he did half the work. Yeah. <laughs> TM, TM, TM. So that's basically my list. I'm sure uh, maybe I'll come back and visit this sometime yeah. in the future. Yeah. Um, some of them really good, I think. Half of them solved <laughs> instantly. <laughs> As you guys just pointed out. <laughs> no, I think that was really cool. Yeah. Let's seize the means of production. And uh, next one? <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. That was just a complete communist reference there, too. What? <laughs> Seize the means of production is a communist line. Oh, geez. I definitely, I'm just not smart. Oh, okay, cool. Um, okay, so I wanted to talk about something uh, just so much better. Um, oh, by the way, <laughs> are, we not, are, we, are we still recording right now? I thought we'd pause during this part. Are we paused? No. Oh, okay. Um, anyways. Um, so, no, that, that communist thing, you said that on, on the... <laughs> we're actually I mean, twitching. I just thought, like, since we're talking politics, we'll just make our stances clear, you know? Calum for communism. Eat the rich. Just want to eat the rich. Is okay. that another line? Yeah. I wanted to talk about something. Mine's actually kind of light. Um, prison. So, uh... There's... How does that thing work? <laughs> what is that? Let's, let's, let's dive into that, huh? <laughs> So, uh, Caleb, do you believe in the death penalty? I'm just kidding. Oh my goodness. <laughs> I'm not talking about that. <laughs> uh, and then my subject for today is abortion. <laughs> oh, God. Oh, no. We're off the rails. <laughs> okay, no, I actually want to talk about, um, like, kind of left of center, like, prisons. Like, or not specific ones, but even though a specific one will show up. But, like, we've all heard of, like, or maybe we haven't, in Norway. Is Norwegian Norway? Alright, I'll keep going. <laughs> anyway, so... And we all just lost credibility <laughs> to ever speak on anything. Yeah, look, you know, I'm just a guy. But I need um, you to cut that part out. <laughs> I refuse. So, <laughs> um, in Norway, 
In Norway? <laughs> <laughs> they have um, a prison system that's really, really different from ours. Do you guys know anything about it? Uh, it's very, it's very friendly towards the prisoners. Is the way yes. I would describe it's very it. Very rehabilitating. Yes. Yeah. So it's um, like the kind of. What I was looking when I was looking stuff up, they were asking these questions. They were like, "What's the point of sending someone to prison?" Um, and like, do you, do you guys want to answer that? I'll cut it out if you don't say anything funny. Is it I, to rehabilitate? From the knowledge I gained one week ago when you brought the subject up while we were camping, uh-huh. is it to rehabilitate? You, yeah. And so, do you think that we do Caleb that? Gets the point. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, good job, you two. <laughs> but do you think that's what America's pr- prison system does? No. Okay, Jay. Um, not enough. Okay, so uh, the differences that I found are numerous uh, in terms of our prisons versus theirs. For example, in 2014, uh, in like August or something like that, they figured out all the numbers and they had 4,000 inmates in a country of like full. I think it's five million actually. Um, so 5 million people, 4,000 people are in prison. That's 75 people per 100,000, and the U.S. is, is 707 per 100,000. Yeah, not good. So it's, you know, it's quite a bit more. And the differences are, like, people think, you know, there is this story about a, you know, ex-prison warden or retired prison warden from New York that went over there, said that the prisons were literally, like, it's like a like a vacation. Like the only thing you could possibly do to to make their lives more comfortable is just give them the keys to the prison. Like so they can just do whatever whatever they want. People were having like a super huge issue with this. Like Americans especially, they were like, "What what's going on?" And like there was a specific guy who he bombed some place and like there was he was a mass shooter. He killed like seventy seven people. I know. Yeah. I heard of that guy. Yeah, I know yeah. that guy. Yeah, all right. Yeah, uh, I know, know that, that guy. guy. We we like this. We went to prison together. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but so he got the maximum prison sentence that you can get in Norway yeah. is twenty one years. Mm-hmm. That's t- that's the top that you can get. And Americans were like, "Are you serious? This man needs to go away for life. Like, if you're not going to kill him, put him in there forever." Yeah. And so that was something where they. Like, their system actually comes into play where, like, they have the answer to that question, and it's at the end of the sentence, even if it's the maximum one, 21 years, um, they can decide, okay, we can add another five years to your sentence. And they can just do that indefinitely, like, for the sentence. Ooh, that's a little bit torturous when you think of it, because, like, for the prisoner, you're just, you know, you're in jail, and you're like, oh, I'm reaching the end of my 25-year sentence? 21, I think. 21-year sentence. And then, like... I'm not sure how long of a delay it is before, like, when you receive the news, but, like, imagine just, like, a week before, you're like, I'm gonna get out, and then they're just like, you got five more years. Well, but the thing is, oh, go ahead, Jay. I was gonna say, I feel like you'd you'd get kind of a feeling. Like, I feel like if you were in there and you killed that many people, people, you'd probably get to get that five years. Yeah, I think you can probably feel it in the air. Well, but the thing is, is they have a... (laughs) They have like a hearing or something like that but they decide whether or not you're rehabilitated that's what adds the five years if they don't believe you're rehabilitated they don't let you back out so like you know it's not this you know if the dude yeah the dude would probably be like ah yeah I I probably will (laughs) like I'll probably get the five years (laughs) here's a gun here's a person uh, and they just watch you like twitch <laughs> like, like hey we don't know if you're ready for the outside and I was like that makes sense like and it really talks about like giving people the benefit of the doubt deciding whether or not like oh okay you know you seem rehabilitated it's not like some random thing where they see you after 20 years and they're like they talk to you for 10 minutes and they're like oh, okay how you doing like Shawshank Redemption or whatever yeah. it's just an interview yeah. and it's like yeah I feel like people you. think that a system like that is probably way dumber than it actually is. Like, they're they probably really yeah. checking this guy to make sure he actually is rehabilitated. They're probably, they're more than aware that people are going to try and trick the system to get out early, yeah. even with their bad ideologies exactly. still there. And the way that they check it out is that, like, the for one, they don't call them prison guards, they call them prison officers. Okay. Because they don't want to make prisoners feel like caged animals. Yeah. Because their philosophy is, we are creating, like, good neighbors for you when they get out they're you know they're teaching them woodworking and all those like skills and stuff that like yeah. you can learn in prison that you can like, be a contributing member of society yeah exactly around. and they're saying if you treat them like caged animals then you're just releasing caged animals are you trying to create anger or are you trying to create like rehabilitation they've really thought it out and the prison officers are super involved in these guys lives they are um 
for one, they there's no bars on the windows in this jail. There is fully there's a fully equipped like everything like kitchen recording studio like they can you know make music and like I think they have a radio station or something. They can like make that. a podcast. They could make a podcast whenever they wanted. But like there's I saw a picture and it was an actual picture from it's called Holden Prison. It's like the nicest one there, and. They have, like, a fully equipped kitchen with knives and, like, sharp things, like, things like that. They yeah. trust them completely, and it's, like, they still have a structured, like, this is what you get to do, this is your free time, like, all it's that kind of like stuff. It's like if you respect someone as human, then they tend to form a sense of respect back towards other humans. That's what I'm saying. So they have, like, this thing where they, like, spend time with guards and, sorry, officers and inmates, like, completely intermingle. They eat together, they'll do leisure activities, like they were talking about playing volleyball together. Yeah. They just do their very best to motivate these guys into being better, like, just as people. So it's a really intimate thing. So it's not like you're seeing this guy after 21 years having a 10 minute interview. There are people who are hanging out with them, like literally hanging out with them, seeing if they've changed, how they treat other people, how they act in these games and things that they're doing. And I think that's a really, really cool way to, for one, keep an eye on them and make them not feel like they are just monsters that nobody trusts. Yeah. You are just friends with these guys. Like, you need to be a part of their lives and you need to, you know, make sure they're not doing anything crazy. But their freedom is taken away. Like, they don't have individual freedoms. Mm. Some people are like, oh, you know, you're just giving them a vacation, but they really, you know, you don't get to do whatever you want all the time. Yeah. It's very structured. You're One of the things about a day. vacation when you take it is you enjoy the freedom yeah. that comes with a vacation. Exactly. You get to choose where you go in the world and mm -hmm. you're not thinking about work or anything like that. But when you're there, it's not a vacation. Exactly. And this whole thing, you can tell it works because, sorry. Obviously, like, there's a bunch of different factors in prisons and things like that. I'm not saying I found the answer and why yeah. aren't we doing this. I totally understand that if people were to do that in the U.S., some people would take advantage of it and all that kind of stuff. Like, I, it sucks, but it's the truth. It mm. happens. But in Norway, I have Norway written here, so I didn't need to ask you guys anything. Um, anyway, in Norway. <laughs> Norwegia? Norwegian. When people like get out, they stay out of prison. They have a twenty percent recidivism, and that's kind of like yeah. if people are going back rate. And the U.S. has seventy six point seven percent are arrested again within the first five years of being released. So something that I want to bring up when we're talking about like these prison rates is uh, something I heard about Japan recently. Mm -hmm. It's uh, so Japan has one of like notoriously the lowest like prison rates in the world. And like, apparently you hear that and you're like, wow, what are they doing right over there? But apparently the reasoning for it is that prosecutors tend to only take somebody to court if they're absolutely sure that they can put them away. Oh. So, like, when I'm, like, hearing statistics about prison like this now, I'm a little bit, like, curious about, like, what kind of factors are at hand that may be outside of just common knowledge on what are affecting these. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's a very valid point. Yeah. This is, even that 4,000 inmates for 5 million people was one year. Yeah. You know, I don't have this to... I can't say that word. Statistics for every year. Yeah. And, like, seeing how great they are. I know in the when this dude, this guy is really, really into, like, this new way of doing things. The prison, like, system, the guy who's in charge. Yeah. He's super into it. He's starting different programs and things like that all the time to make them feel more and more like they're just people. And like Is the warden? It's No, it's, like, above him. So it's okay. not just for a specific prison. Gotcha. It's the entire prison system. Of oh, okay. Like the government yeah. official for it. Yeah, so he is super into it, and he's very, very, like, he's super motivated to make sure they're having the best lives they possibly can That's while awesome. knowing that they're, they did something wrong, and they are going to have to you know fill out their sentence like they're gonna have to stay the whole time i mean that's one of the a lot of the times in america you hear people say oh this person's not being punished for his crime in that country but like what punishment could possibly be worse than realizing the severity of what you did and having to live with that for life if you are rehabilitated you'll realize what you did was wrong and have to live with that that's what they were saying 
when you treat them like this and when you do that, you're not trying to reform them. You're trying to punish them for the thing they did. Yeah. And while some people, you know, the punishment is that you don't have freedom, that you were born with this thing that inherently everyone believes that everyone should have and you got it taken away because you abused it. That's a super serious thing. And when you say that prison is a punishment, like in what I view the American prison system, it's a, it's a deterrent, yeah, but it's a fear deterrent. And then once you're in, especially if you're wrongfully convicted, but let's say you did it, did something wrong. Like you, it's not teaching you yeah, why it was it's wrong. It's not teaching you. It's just being like, you did something wrong, so do your time and then leave and then yeah. good luck. Like, we'll see you in under five years statistically. Like, it's just, <laughs> <laughs> it's just a little bit of a bummer. There are drawbacks, though. I don't want to just say that this is the perfect solution. Like, there's a reason yeah. that people don't do it. Um, one of them, I mean, even like I talked about, like, if I went to prison in Norway and I was bad enough to, like, do something, like, what's stopping me from doing it again? I mean, I'm sure they have to have some sort of uh, legislation there for repeated offenders. Yeah, I'm sure. So I'm sure it But still, the maximum is 21 years. Yeah. And if they keep doing it, you know, the repeated offenders, like, it, it kind Especially of Especially if you're it. a repeated offender, then it's really going to show that they have to be even more critical during that rehabilitation check. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So they'll probably take an even more critical eye towards you, and you'll be more likely to get that five years extra. Yeah. You know, um, in... <clears throat> In church, actually, but uh, they they talked about this thing where you talk about people and to people, like you put a crown on their head and watch them grow into it. They've said that multiple times where you, yeah. you know, you just believe that someone is capable of being better than they currently feel. And they will eventually have that same faith in themselves that you have in them because... If someone's speaking that, like, over your life and all that kind of stuff, like, you want to live up to it. Like, it's not something where you're just, oh, you know, this is just how I am. Like, you want to beat that. Like, you okay. don't want to put yourself in a box. Mm-hmm. Yes. You're a good man. <laughs> you're you're a good man. You're a good man, <laughs> you're the... Hey, Jake, you're also a good man. <laughs> oh, yeah, good man. man. Was, you're the Thank best you. type of man. <laughs> how, how, how much do they the focus man. on um, mental health? In mental health rehabilitation like you know like that 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 guy is kind of an outlier i, I know the story you're talking about that guy yeah. that killed like a bunch of people mm-hmm. uh, and that guy is clearly not okay to make that kind of decision bunch of children too. yeah yeah to make that kind of decision that you are clearly there's something wrong up there and so obviously with something that extreme they'll probably keep on adding that extra five years or whatever um Probably, I would imagine, until he dies. Like, I don't know how good you can be from that. Yeah. But I don't, I, but for less extreme cases, you know. I let's imagine, say you kill... Oh, sorry, go ahead. No, I just... I imagine that it's, still, it's like a separate thing, just like it is here. They would go to mental... Like, if you're just deemed sane and, like, capable of thinking about what you did and realizing that it's wrong, you go to prison. But otherwise, it would be a mental institution. Yeah. I think that would be how they handle that. And obviously, that guy isn't right in the head, but maybe, you know... If someone's right in the head and they still are conscious of life, they, I, in my opinion, they deserve to go. I have never met anyone like that. I have been in that situation and speaking completely from an outside perspective. But from my current knowledge of what that is, like, they are pretty good at deeming you sane enough to realize what you did was wrong. Yeah. Because you can't just be like... I oh, have, I'm a crazy man. Let me go. Yeah, back to people trying to get person. out of stuff all the time like that. Yeah. And point I want to make: you're talking about the relationships between the officers and the and the people there. Mm-hmm. Um, Sour Patch Kids would definitely not make it because they're first they're sour, then they're sweet. <laughs> You know, and you were talking about... Wow, I made this joke so late. Like, I had this grab, joke in my grab mind the guitar, 15 man. minutes ago. Got it. Got it. <laughs> cool. Got it. There's, one more, there's one more drawback, and then I'm, I'm done. Um, this costs <laughs> so much money to yeah, keep like this thing running. Like, you look at the rooms, they look like a mix between a hospital room and a hotel room. They look like a more comfortable hospital room. They got like personal TVs, personal showers, bathrooms. I can each person never has see that working in America. I it's oh it's seventy five uh, acres. Yeah, like, it's in big. America, the American industrial prison complex is like meant to make money, and you're not only giving up making money to put the system in, but you're, you're spending, spending more on it. 
So Plus that's such a huge chunk of change just lost for so many people that I just, as great as it sounds, oh my goodness, that would take so much work to It would be like starting small. I think it's possible. I think it would be starting smaller. Yeah. You know, just start somewhere like start a small relatively crime-free, like New York yeah. or something like that. Yeah, <laughs> something, something like that. <laughs> Plus like LA maybe. Norway is, Norway, I'm sorry. Uh, Norway is like very small. Compared to the I mean, continent, yeah, it's five US, people. You, yeah. It's it would be kind of hard to sample that in the United States. I feel like there'd be outrage. Like, I guess it's like why are, why are these people in like Nebraska getting this awesome Norwegian treatment? Yeah. Uh, but these rest, people just over just to in test Cali it out, are right? getting something crap still. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it'd be tough to. So you'd have to like. It, it almost seems like you have to go all the way in. Like if we're talking about America, trying to adjust maybe to be more like Norway. Well, we, you did, you yeah. kind of have to go all in, right? Or I mean, what we got to do is we got to here's what we got to do: we got to take down the American government, ah, to just take it down completely. Did we I mention st- the NSA story uh, about like how we're definitely being listened in? Or... It doesn't matter. Okay. Um, you know they can't stop. Just checking. It. So <laughs> they we completely break it down, make a bunch of different countries that are all you know five million a piece, and uh, boom, each country has their own chance. Easy, easy, e. Why are you grabbing the guitar? I'm not done. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> end it. Let me keep so talking about it. We've got to record it. I'm going to pre record the guitar for this episode. It's beautiful. That's a, that's a jam. All right, Caleb, make us sad. <laughs> Welcome to. Oh. oh, I'm still playing. Uh, that that does play some sad animation. guitar chords. Sorry Welcome to Caleb's Sad History Hour. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> um, today we're going to be talking about Japanese holdouts. Kagan, I know you know what Japanese holdouts are. Uh, if you guys have seen King Kong, uh, John C. Riley made a friend with a Japanese holdout. It's Is all, that really the thing? I what? swear to you, it's all. That's, That's a, the reason he was friendly. Jay, do you know what a Japanese holdout is? <laughs> a Japanese really. holdout, I got this, okay. is someone who, they're usually, you know, you can say the real definition afterwards, but usually they're like kind of isolated a little bit, and so they think that the war is still going on, and when people tell them that it's over, they think that it's someone trying to trick them. Specifically, <laughs> World War Two. Yeah, yeah, sorry, sorry. So, after the surrender in August 1945 of Japan to the United States, uh, a lot of these soldiers that were deployed in places like the Philippines and Guam didn't get the memo. Hmm. Well, the thing is, there were three reasons why they didn't come out of holding, uh, out of hiding. And those are, they either doubted the agreement between the United States, thinking the United States won't honor it, Oh. Uh, they stayed based on their own ideology, which I'll get a little bit into how, what that means later, or they simply just didn't know. So, okay. and I think that last one in particular is the worst, because imagine just spending like five years of your life in the cave. And Wasn't then, like it more you than five for some people? Oh, oh, oh yeah. yeah. The war <laughs> so, was at least ten years ago. <laughs> the war ended in 1945. There were Dozens of these men found in the 1950s. Okay, yeah. The final one was found in 1974. So I'm just going to go in and break it down leading up to that 1974 one. Yeah. With some different guys who were these holdout soldiers. The first one was Hiro Anoda. I'm sorry, there's going to be so many Japanese names that I'm going to mess up today. We could do a TV show thing again. What's that? What's that? Oh, where I just replaced the name to a Spongebob character. So Spongebob Squarepants was a Japanese holdout. Uh, (laughs) We'll do Danny Phantom. Uh, (laughs) Who remembers more characters in Danny Phantom than Danny Phantom? Oh my gosh. Danny Phantom. Danny Phantom. Boom. Danny Phantom. (laughs) Sam Tucker... Mom and Pa. <laughs> All my favorite Japanese holdouts. <laughs> Alright, we'll do... I was just kidding. It was a joke. We're doing Sesame Street. Okay. So back <laughs> to Hiro Elmo Anoda. <laughs> uh, so... So this guy, it's kind of tragic what happened to him. When he ended up in this uh, area in, I believe, the Philippines, people realized he was there relatively early on and they started leaving magazines and such in the area and 
he would find them and he wouldn't believe them because he thought that they were American crafted propaganda to bring Japanese soldiers out of their hiding. Okay, really quick. This yeah. was at what time? I believe this was in the 1950s still. When and he was seeing these magazines. He, he was by himself? He was by himself at this point. Uh, actually, at this point, there were three of them in this cave. And they all had the same... In the Philippines. They were all like, no, these are fake. Yeah. Jeez. It gets worse. Oh. Uh, so they got in several shootouts with the local police... Uh, who came to try and arrest these men living in a cave, shooting at random civilians walking by. Wait, Wait. this is Rambo. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Caleb, Caleb, you just read the Wikipedia <laughs> article for Rambo. Oh, dang it. <laughs> so, uh, the first time they saw a leaflet describing the end of the war was in 1945, the year of the end of the war. The real just leaflet. In, but all of them doubted the legitimacy of it. So nobody bought it. Um, Wait, was so, the leaflet sent from back home? Like, <laughs> like what? I just, so that's the thing. One of them actually, I believe it was like in 1953, maybe I want to say, uh, the Japan flew them over because Japan started realizing that these holdout soldiers were everywhere. Yeah. Um. So they started dropping pamphlets signed by uh, military commanders. Okay. Of the Imperial Japanese military, which had been disbanded at this time, but they got these guys <laughs> to write these letters to be dropped over these nations. Mm-hmm. And they, they, these three men found it, got together, and they decided it was forged by the Americans. You know that which if is one so person tragic. got that instead of three, like, they definitely hyped themselves up. They're yeah. like, they're like, wait a second. <laughs> There's no way. You know, he's right, real. he's right. There's no way this is ri- <laughs> true. It's like, well, I don't know, guys. And then they just lose that argument. It's two on one. Um, like, no. So it gets a little sadder from here. Oh. Uh, one, uh, three of them in the cave. One, wa- one of them was shot in 1953 by a group of fishermen. Uh, just in the area. Stop fishermen that are dumb. Yeah. This whole life. <laughs> you know what? We tried. Uh, that guy did heal. Uh, but the next one was... With no doctor? Uh, yeah, they nursed him back to health. So, yeah, incredible. These guys were Say really... Say will. These guys, these guys were dope. really skilled individuals. Yeah. And, like, you gotta understand, one For thing I want to establish before we get any farther into these guys was the Imperial Japanese Army was... played so many mind games on their soldiers to get them and put so much propaganda into their hands to try and get them... To fight for their country no matter what and made them terrified of what would happen if they surrendered oh yeah because like I mean that was they were very loyal because I mean yeah. that was where the attack on Pearl Harbor and there will be something I mentioned place. about Hero later on that like really exemplifies that but anyways back in 1953 one of them shot by the fishermen um, in 1954 one of the men did died uh, because of a search party that was trying to find them. <laughs> he did die. Did die. <laughs> did die. <laughs> I was yawning, so we <laughs> turned it into a laugh. <laughs> uh, one of them did die by a search party looking for them uh, because he tried attacking <laughs> he tried them. And, at them. Yeah, they killed, they killed one of them. Uh, another one of them was killed in 1972 when they were burning rice of local farmers. Wait, you said you were going to work up to the 1974 one. Oh. Yeah, this, uh, is this is 1970. <laughs> that was 30 years. Listen, all the 15, all the ones from the 50s were boring, okay? Oh, like, okay I want cool. the 1970s ones that have lived oh in caves for 30 years of their lives. But anyways, uh, yeah, he was killed in 1972 because these guys were still... Fighting for the Japanese military during this time, so they were burning the crops of locals. <laughs> what? Like no. they were going around burning the rice of the locals. You don't have just one like group of Japanese people who are like, you know what? We realize they're still out there. Let's just, you know, we're rich enough. Let's just go and do the rice burning is- and to let them know it's over. I'm not sure what Hiro's age was during this point, but like it's been like 20, 20 to thirty years. So this is like a 50-year-old man running around just burning people's yeah, rice awesome. in the night. So possibly <laughs> mixing it with, like, PTSD. And- uh, yeah, he, this dude's seen some stuff. Uh, eventually, they even, like, family pictures. Like, they got these people's family pictures and airdropped them over the area. 
and they still didn't buy it. Uh, that is so involved. Now, here is my favorite part about this story, where Norio Suzuki comes in, and this guy is a young Japanese car manufacturer adventurer. Uh, and he right. leaves Japan on a quest. He leaves saying he's going to travel around the world, quote, looking for Lieutenant Onoda, a panda, and the abominable snowman in that order. Abominable. Abominable. Exactly, yeah. Yeah, nailed it. Uh, <laughs> Sorry, wait, in that order. I just. In I that order. <laughs> So, he found a Nada in 10 days. Okay. He, he found was, a panda in 12. <laughs> <laughs> a bomb oh, snowman? <laughs> He's never been seen yeah. since. <laughs> Anyways, uh, so Onoda uh, sees this man walking through the woods. And he sees... This is how Onoda later described this Suzuki character. He said, if he had not been wearing socks, Anoda would write later, I might have shot him. But he had on these thick woolen socks, even though he was wearing sandals. The islanders would never do anything so incongruous. You don't wear incongruous. You don't I'm wear socks with sandals, man. Come on, I just, you keep saying this I'm an electrical dude. engineer and I have to let people know that I got something <laughs> going on in my head. <laughs> this dude, Hiru, didn't kill a man because he had socks with sandals on. And honestly, the rest of the world would have killed a man if he was wearing socks and sandals. My dad so, almost died. This <laughs> was what... Every time he barbecued. <laughs> this was what saved Hiru. But he still wasn't willing to come out, even though this man's ja- obviously native Japanese demeanor... Obviously wearing socks with sandals. Obviously wearing socks cool with sandals. Cool guys, obviously. Uh, but Hiro recognized that this guy was definitely native Japanese. And he talked to him, and he still refused to come out. But he, they flew out his former military commander, who at this point just ran a little shop in Tokyo. Can I say real quick that probably, look, first 20 years, he was probably like, no, I, I yeah. refuse. After that, that he was probably just, just embarrassed. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's just, he was just like, no, 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 no. I, it, it's really One like, of these guys later on does just say, I've never been more embarrassed <laughs> when he comes out. <laughs> which is so heartbreaking. Because, Anyways, uh, so they fly out this old former commander to the Philippines. Yeah. And he gives him a full, formal Japanese military, like, resignation. Like, gets him out of the military. He comes out with his sword, a 25 caliber rifle, 500 rounds of ammunition, several hand grenades, and a dagger his mother told him to kill himself with upon capture by the enemy. Thanks, Mom. So that that's the part that kind that of exemplifies the propaganda that was kind of put into these guys' heads over the course, was that these guys really believed if they were captured, they were going to be killed. I'm really like, where do you get the grenades and ammunition from? Right, it's been 30 right? years. And he's been shooting people, obviously. Like, yeah. He's been going in. Where did he get all this stuff from, do you know? Some of these guys specifically didn't use their guns a lot during that time. Well, especially but... for hunting. They didn't. They refused to use it because they were afraid of the attention it would bring from locals. So how are they getting food? Are they just going into shops after Some of them straight up them? made farms. Like, they made farms in the forest. Can we just say that these are the best men that <laughs> exist? Like, oh my gosh, <laughs> they're so dope. So, he, he flew back to Japan. He wrote a book called No Surrender, My 30-Year War, which you can read. Um, he openly wept when he was finally out of the military. And he very much struggled to adapt back to modern life, as you'd expect. So, he moved to Brazil to raise cows. He was already doing it. Yep. He was like, uh, he heard about Japanese people moving over there, and he didn't agree with like the modern Japanese youth, so he moved to Brazil to raise cows. Modern until... Japanese youth? Yep. Didn't like him. Was he a youth? Not conservative. Not, not anymore, dude. He's like 50 at this point. <laughs> so why is he worried about the youth of Japan? <laughs> because he wants them to have traditional Japanese ideals, and at this point, America had been like, you know, having their fingers in Japan for a while, and kind of making a more liberal Japan. Hmm. Uh... So, and he was pardoned, by the way, because he did kill and people and shoot at police. He was pardoned by the president of the Philippines at the time. Uh, He lived in Brazil, uh, raising cows until 1984, 
uh, with his wife. Oh my gosh. And did he write a book? Eventually he came I already told you about the book. Oh, I was talking about nineteen eighty four. Uh he came back to Japan and ran a nature camp for kids until he passed in twenty fourteen. Wow. And he donated ten thousand dollars of his own money to that camp. I think that that's like so wholesome. What a what a yeah, right? This is happy Caitlin's historical quarter. Yeah, man. I really thought this was going dark. I mean no. we still got time. Yeah, we like, still got like a few more guys <laughs> to talk about. <laughs> Don't worry, Caitlin, we'll get how he died is an dark. interesting story. <laughs> uh, and then I'm gonna tell you about how that ten thousand dollars uh, triggered a genocidal war. Uh of all the birds. <laughs> So, Hiro Onoda is by far the most famous of these uh, holdouts, Mm -hmm. but there are some others. There is Soichi Yokoi, uh, who said, we Japanese soldiers were told to prefer death to the disgrace of getting captured alive. And that's, Mm -hmm. again, just a little bit of sound of the propaganda. He knew the war was over since 1952 and was eventually captured in 1972. Uh, he lived alone a majority of the time, but regularly visited two others on this area who he had basically shared a camp with from 1945 uh, until 1952. Uh, during that time, eventually, the other two guys died in a flood in 1964, and he continued living in his uh, cave in Guam. How long were they? You just happen to get top bunk like during that, during that rainy season. Oh, uh, just enjoy it. Um, but how? 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 Hmm. When were they deployed during the war? Like, I believe it was like in the, forty-three. I'm not entirely sure on that. Two years, and then they had a lot of these guys were just dropped on these islands and told defend it. Until we tell you to come back. Defend this much. inhabited island that is, you're a guy. And you, you see Americans here, you kill them. Oh, it's just Americans. Well, I'm sure Chinese weren't really welcome either during the Well, that's that what time. I'm saying. So, like, they're being dropped on islands where they're just supposed to, like, okay, take it over. You're three guys. I know you're the best guys. No, there were there were tons of other guys, like, dropped on these islands with so them. So then how were they? Some just kill left behind. So everyone Plus else these knew. guys moved, too. Like, this group, for example, when he first landed there, there were 11 of them in this group. This is the big group they that you're split, talking about? Okay, okay, okay I think there were, there were, on this part of the island, of oh. Guam, there were 11 of them deployed in this one little group. Eight of them split off and eventually found their way back home. Because they knew the war ended? <laughs> yeah, they found out that the war ended when they split from their group and they managed to get the information. So these guys are all the... Three end. of them didn't. Two of them died, still not knowing, in 1964, and then the one guy stayed in there fighting in Guam until he was discovered, fought some locals, and just got knocked out, um, and then they dragged them to their house, gave him some hot soup, and he felt much better about talking to them, and then dragged him to the commissioner's office, and he felt much just better about talking to him, and they dragged him again. <laughs> <laughs> I can't trust you guys. <laughs> Wait, oh no! <laughs> I just love the soup line in there because like, they, on the process of bringing him to the commissioner's office, they gave him some hot soup. Yeah. Uh, I'm just like, so these guys are already the antisocial ones that are like, yeah, we didn't stick with the eight because we're better, all right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what the conversation was. I'm just saying, they're already the ones who want to be by themselves anyway. No wonder they lean so hard into this. <laughs> Um, he ended up saying, uh, quote, it is with much embarrassment that I returned. So he even said specifically the word embarrassment. Uh, he eventually visited the Tokyo, uh, the palace in Japan. He said, uh, he said, your majesties, I have returned home. I deeply regret that I cannot serve you well. The world has certainly changed, but my determination to serve you will never change. So even after being left, being left there. For so long and being declared dead decades earlier, he still vowed, like, servitude to this dynasty that had been pretty much, like, disbanded at this point. Like, it still existed, but no longer on, like, the same level as Imperial Japan. Mm -hmm. Uh, He became a TV personality. I would, too. Uh, <laughs> There's he, no one like me. These guys experienced <laughs> these guys experienced great fame, by the way, when they went back. Like people wanted to know all about that, just like we like we're reading this. <laughs> like this is crazy. Everybody else thought so too. 
uh, time zone changed that much. He became a TV personality, hosted a show about being like stoicism or something like that, living in a simplistic lifestyle. Uh, and he died in 1997 and was buried in the gravestone his mother made for him in 1955. Oh, because she thought he, she thought he was dead. What is life like when they come back? Like, not e- I mean, in terms of that, they're apparently pretty pretty dope. But, like, what if you had a wife? Are you... Like, you're not married anymore? This she is found like, somebody else. I'm gonna be real. This is the most real-world Captain America stuff you could possibly have. Oh, that's true. Like, this guy is coming back to a whole new technology. It's a huge amount of culture shock because Japan has changed a ridiculous amount during mm-hmm. this time. And I'm not sure if any of them had wives or kids. Yeah, didn't come up. But... Family member, you come home and your family's been dead for a decade or so. Your kid is twenty. Yeah, like, it's it's insane stuff. Just, just a stranger, just part of the youth yeah. that you don't like. Yeah, <laughs> angle kids. Uh, you can read he has his like book. An American like girlfriend. <laughs> no, no, you. Yeah. I'm going back to Guam. Uh. He has a book called Private Yokoi's uh, War and Life on Guam, 1944 to 1972. And there's a tourist location you can visit on Guam called Yokoi's Cave, where you can take a rope, a ropeway ride to. Oh. So these places actually become huge tourist locations afterwards. And uh, here's where you use the restroom. Here's uh, 30 years of poop. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, oh, that over there, that's a 30 years of poop pile. <laughs> uh, and this is, uh, we saw this and realized that people need free deodorant because it smells terrible. <laughs> <laughs> so like like I said, the last one was discovered in 1974. Mm-hmm. So, uh, but there's still rumors, obviously, circulating around Guam and Philippines and the like. Mm-hmm. Uh, of these guys still existing out there because it's a great tourism industry apparently. Oh, People to love keep the to come here. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. It inspires like tourism. It's just by like a random like actor, old man. <laughs> <laughs> it's just some uh, like. Could you just imagine if they were like on a budget and they just got like some forty year old Japanese man in there and they're like, "Hey, wait a second, <laughs> that guy looks a little young." This old guy just shooting blanks at fishermen that pass by. <laughs> Um, so there were some, I'm almost near the end now, there were some that stayed fighting, um, because of ideological reasons. So they didn't, like, stop fighting after the end of the war. So, oh, I'm gonna mess these up. Shigeyuki Hishimoto and Kiyoaki Tanaka, uh, fought with the Malayan Communist Party until 1990. Uh, which is kind of weird because the... Malayan Communist Party fought against Japan during World War II, but eventually, uh, because they were fighting with the British, the British occupied Malaysia, and the Communist Party turned on them and tried getting them out of the country, and these guys were like, yeah, I can fight for that cause, that seems similar to the Japanese ideology, so they fought for the independence of Malay, Malaya, a taboo subject in Malaysia, and, and communist beliefs to this day. Uh, and yeah, those guys just felt like fighting another war and to a degree were considered these holdout soldiers. Mm, but in reality, they were like, all right, fine. You stopped your fight, but I'll keep mine going. Basically, that's what they went with. They were like, oh, the Japanese government is wrong to give up the war. We're going to keep fighting the war. So, uh, Private Teruo Nakumara, uh, he was a Taiwanese soldier. He was discovered. He was the last one of these holdout soldiers to be discovered. He was discovered in 1974 by a pilot. 29 years after the end of the war, almost went for a good 30. Uh, Dude, he was declared dead in 1945. In 1956, he left a separate group of Japanese holdouts and formed his own little camp where he grew bananas and I think bell peppers. He made a little farm in the jungle. Uh, the 11 soldiers who reached what would be later dubbed as Nakamaru Nakamura City on the morning of 18 December 1974 had made careful preparations for their encounter with this lonely soldier. They had memorized the words of the Japanese national anthem, which they sang in unison as they emerged from the jungle. That is terrifying. And they had equipped themselves with a photo of a geisha. Because they assumed that a man who hadn't seen a woman in 30 years might have certain desires. And that might be enough to get him out of the woods. I'm just saying, like... Wait, with a photo of a geisha? They had a photo of a geisha. 
probably would slightly lose one. But mm. also, if someone, if 30 people came out of the woods saying, the land of the free, <laughs> I would be terrified. I would run so far. God, God, you just, lived in, you just lived in the American Southwest for 30 years, <laughs> defending the Grand Canyon. Like, you hear that, you're like, my people have come. What is the, is there, is there any threat that these stories have in common? Uh, zero. Right. Zero thread this time, boys. Alright, I don't know what the title of this will be, but... Um, Socks with sandals. <laughs> save Socks lives. with sandals save lives, yes. <laughs>